The year was 1903. The country had a vibrant young president, everyone called Teddy. That same year, two bicycle mechanics were trying out a new contraption they hoped would allow them to fly. In Boston, an upstart baseball team competed in a series of games with a team from Pittsburgh. Boston won with a pitcher named Cy Young. They called this brand new contest the World Series. And on the North Shore of Massachusetts, a family was about to move into a new house. It wasn't just any house. Four years earlier, noted Boston architect William Rantoul started drawing a house fit for a successful industrialist. He would take his inspiration from great manor houses of Scotland. The house would sit on 2,000 acres on the north side of the Ipswich River and would be home to the Rice family. Nehemiah Rice from Beverly made a fortune in the leather trade. His son Charles G. Rice continued the merchant tradition, first as a leather importer, then in mining and metals. The family could afford the best, and Charles spared nothing in the construction of his new family home. It would be a house with 14 bedrooms, and incredibly for the time, 14 bathrooms. It was to have a pond for skating, a pool for swimming, tennis, squash, and most important to the family, riding. Three years after they broke ground, Turner Hill, as the house would be called, was finished, and the family rode up the long gravel road to their new home. It was magnificent. Originally, the main entrance did not come around the pond as it does now. Uh, it came sort of the back way, so you really never saw the mansion up front as you were approaching the property. Neil Vore is the president of Turner Hill Golf Club. Walking through this house, it's just a time that you don't get to see that often anymore. The first room upon entering was a long main corridor with a decorative fireplace and Jacobian ceiling. To the right was the library with its massive wall of books hundreds of artisans that were here imported from overseas to work on this. You know, the frieze that you see around these buildings, you know, is all hand done. I mean, it's not uh, something they went out and bought and stuck in. Um, the carvings above the door where you see the peacock theme everywhere, hand carved. I mean, it's not something they went out and bought a wood peacock and, you know, put it up there. In the evening, gentlemen would retire to the smoking room with its own escape to the second floor. The grand staircase was imposing and led to the living quarters on the second floor. At the top of the stairs were four guest bedrooms, each with a full bath. The tubs um, were just so unique. They, I was always told they weighed 2,000 pounds, but who knows, it, but they were all concrete with hand-layered ceramic around it. Um, just really special. Farther down the hall was a bedroom for Mr. Rice and one for Mrs. Rice, and a separate dressing room for Mrs. Rice. But that's not all. There were bedrooms for children, a study, a sewing room, laundry, storage, and on the east side of the building, servants' quarters. I don't think you could duplicate this today. I think that skill of labor has unfortunately disappeared to automated ways of building. It was in the same league as other great houses of the day. The Biltmore Estate, the Crane Estate. The Rice family lived a life like few families before or since. When I was a kid, yeah, I spent a lot of school vacations here, both the spring and winter and summer vacations. And uh, of course the owners of the property were uh, my grandparents. Thomas Rice Jr. is the oldest living relative of the Rice family. As a child, he was chauffeured to the estate for summers and holidays. I lived in the room straight up there. Uh, when we were here, and my brother lived in one of the other rooms up there. I guess my favorite room was grandfather's smoking room. <laughs> I just liked the place, and probably because it was some place we weren't supposed to go unless we were invited. <laughs> What's now called the breakfast room, where you, we all, uh, my brother and I always ate in there. I can only remember once or twice eating in the main dining hall. The main dining room was reserved for grown-ups. Tom Rice can still recall a slight indiscretion perpetrated on the adults by his grandmother. It was a big dinner here, and uh, one of the butlers came in and uh, whispered to grandmother, the turkey fell on the floor. And grandmother said, well, pick it up. <laughs> 
And that was the end of that. <laughs> it was a whole different life. Lily Rice was married to Charles G. Rice's grandson. She recounts stories reminiscent of the Crawley family in Downton Abbey. They'd have house guests that would stay, and one weekend they had more house guests than they had bedrooms. So they came to Mrs. Rice, what are we going to do? And she said, okay, we'll keep them up all night and the others can sleep and then we'll switch and you could change the sheets. <laughs> Turner Hill was not only the home of the Rice family, but to 30 men, women and children made the house run. There were butlers, maids, stable boys and cooks, chauffeurs, grooms and nannies. The entries in Anne Rice's handwritten ledger tell the story. Well, I did all the different farm jobs, horse jobs, uh, inside the house. And a lot of them lived on the third floor. Well, I imagine the cooking staff was a, was a big part of it. Um, certainly, uh, looking through the bills, that was the most significant expense they had, was the chef and, and obviously the groceries and all those sorts of things. Uh, I'd imagine that all the people, Mr. Rice, Mrs. Rice, and the kids had their own footmen, um, had their own butler, if you will. I imagine that cleaning this house would have been a monumental undertaking. Back then, they had a coal-fired furnace. I think two or three in the kitchen, uh, general household help of probably three people. Uh, there were, I think, two in the garage and at least two in the stables. Herbert, and the general handyman, and uh, Snodgrass, chauffeur. Ann Proctor Rice was the mistress of the house, a beautiful woman. Throughout her life, she maintained a very fashionable, slim figure. She didn't eat anything but coffee and ice water. While eating was not important to Ann Rice, horses were her passion. She would spend long afternoons riding along the miles of trails on the 2,000-acre property. Well, the summer or spring, fall, well, she, she rode every day. Her other passion was the children, not just in her family, but the children from surrounding towns. Every summer, the Rices would host what they called outing classes for children who lived on and off the estate. All the relatives and friends and, and a lot of residents from uh, uh, the area would come and they'd have, I think, as many as eight or nine baseball games going around the property. After that, there'd be refreshments on the front porch, and uh, we'd go swim in the pond, and the little kids swam in the pond, the older kids swam in the pool. My brother and I, we used to paddle around the edge of the pond and reach into the holes between the rocks and get frogs. One of Tom Rice's great adventures as a child was the bike riding lesson, taught not on the drive, but in the vast attic on the third floor. But this is a big attic, <laughs> a lot of room. And there was a workbench out there, up there, and carpenter tools, and, uh, and a gentleman named of, uh, Hurlbert, and he was, he was the general handyman on the place that would uh, teach us how to do things. Over the years, Turner Hill has seen many celebrities. One of the most famous was a hero of three American wars, General George S. Patton. He was a frequent visitor, but his first trip to the mansion was the most dramatic. It started with a serious automobile accident on Topsfield Road. Well, I, he had an accident, and I guess he was knocked out and covered with dirt. And they brought him up here, and I guess when they cleaned him up, they saw who he was. Patton was related to the Rices by marriage. At Turner Hill, he was known as a prankster. On the 4th of July, the kids, boys all had firecrackers. And George Patton came over and he said, well, now, boys, I'll sit on anything you can light. And he sat down and they lit the firecrackers. Turned out he had his whole trousers stuffed with newspaper. <laughs> when I first heard about that was literally, I mean, that is obviously a very interesting story of the, of the property. And uh, obviously, you know, General Patton is one of those images that has become an icon for all of us through the movie and, and just that, that profile. And, and I'm one of those people that just can't help imagining him being in here. And they used to say this was his room where he used to tell stories after dinners. Looking at this fireplace or um, these chairs or the walls or the books and knowing that he was looking at the exact same thing 50, 60, 70 years ago, 
I've always thought that was really fascinating. For three decades, Turner Hill was a place of wonder for the children around Ipswich and splendor for the Rices and their guests. But in 1933, tragedy struck. Ann Proctor Rice, the woman whose passion touched so many lives, died suddenly doing what she loved. She was killed on horseback. A uh, horse ran away and took her under, a, under an overhanging limb. And, uh, she was, if I remember right, 62 at the time. For the next 10 years, Ann's husband Charles became more and more reclusive. He'd have a desk by the window that looked up at the driveway. They came in that way to the courtyard. And if he didn't want to see somebody, he'd climb the stairs up there, back and go and hide. With the passing of Charles Rice in 1943, none of the other family members were ready to take on the massive responsibility of running Turner Hill. So the family quickly sold the property to an order of the Catholic Church. La Solette ran a seminary there for 30 years. Then in 1997, a developer bought the property from the church. Neil Vores was the first manager at the new Turner Hill. When I first got here, it was just after the property was purchased from the La Salettes by the developer. The worst thing that you see in these houses is people let them go and then you have damage that just is sad to see and becomes prohibitively expensive to prove it or do anything with it. The last let's put, I think, all of their resources and take care of the mansion, and they really just, it really felt like you were walking back in a time. Turner Hill had survived. Many estates of its era had been raised or transformed into museums. The mansion at Turner Hill was destined to return to its grandeur as a magnificent center for social activity. The horses might be gone, but the limos and tennis courts and lavish parties would return. People surrounding Ipswich would once again return to Turner Hill for a grand time.